Hi everyone. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the hardware versus software product management roles. What does product management look like when you're in the hardware space versus the software space and kind of contrast them. My name is Ruben. I'm a product manager at Square um, and I have also been in the hardware space for a few years as a product manager as well. So let's, let's get started. First things about me. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I'm a product manager at Square. I'm the PM for the Square website, so the entire public web. Uh, prior to this, I was a product manager at Intuit. Um, I was part of the QuickBooks family, and I was the PM for contractor payments, which is one of the products within QuickBooks. Um, uh, before that, I had taken a, a, a small break to go to business school, and I was uh, a PM in the hardware space. I was working at Cypress Semiconductor, which got acquired by Infineon uh, prior to my time at Intuit. My f first job was actually in investment banking, uh, but I realized pretty quickly that I really enjoy working in tech. Uh, that was something I did during my undergrad. I, I, I'm an engineer, and I really enjoyed that part of my um, I just enjoy working on technical solutions and solving problems using the power of technology. So I made that switch fairly early on uh, back into the, the tech uh, space. And I definitely enjoy every, every bit of it. Uh, I'm glad I made that transition. I do love, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I do love uh, learning and writing about tech. I actually have published articles about IoT design um, in various leading journals because I really enjoy just kind of absorbing tech. Um, I am a tinker at heart as well. I really uh, I, I spend quite a bit of time, you know, on, on my weekends just working on you know different gadgets and um, coding on Raspberry Pi and just you know little home automation projects. I, I definitely enjoy that. So that's that's a little bit about myself. Uh, during a conversation today, I'm going to be covering the different stages of um, the life of a PM and kind of and contrasting them for hardware versus software. I'm going to, the first two topics, product development and soft and stakeholders are going to be focusing more on the life of the PM. And the, the, the second group of topics, which is uh, skills to succeed and how to make the switch will be more focused on how do you know what, what do you need if you are looking to make that switch from hardware to software or software to hardware? What skills do you need, and how do you actually more tactically kind of make that switch? Um, there are a few things I won't be covering today. Um, I won't be able to cover the specifics of my role at Square or Intuit. Honestly, it's not even relevant for uh, what what I'm going to be covering during the rest of our conversation today. I also won't be covering you know how to become a PM. That's that's the question that is addressed um, through a lot of other, um, you know, events that are organized by Product School. And, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of better resources out there that you can get to actually, you know, how to become a PM and kind of introducing the basics of product management. Um, I also won't be covering interviewing tips and tricks. Um, happy to do that offline, but I don't think I, I'd have the time to actually cover that today. Um, the last thing is I, I, I frequently get asked this question, you know, what, what's what's interesting in, in semiconductor space or in the fintech space? Well, uh, what would that look like, you know, a few years from now? Again, I, I, I really enjoy these kind of conversations. I'm happy to do that um, offline for anyone who's interested. Um, so today I'm going to give you the, the key takeaway, the, you know, the summary of our conversation up front uh, for two reasons. One if you're kind of short on time, this this summary should help you just kind of think through what is the trade-off and you know what is the key difference between hardware or software space. Uh, but for those who are kind of who those who are willing to stay longer, this also helps you kind of have a lens with which to look at some of the other uh, content that I will be covering later on, uh, and just contrast the hardware versus software uh, product management. So here's my my key takeaway. Um, hardware is has a lot in common. is actually quite similar to enterprise software, uh, but enterprise software is is kind of very different from consumer software. So I see this somewhat as a spectrum. On the one hand, you have the enterprise hardware products. If you are selling servers, for example, that's that's the extreme end of that spectrum. And the other end is the consumer software, 
you know, if you're, for example, you are a PM working on Messenger on Facebook, for example, that's a pure consumer software play. Um, in the middle, you have enterprise software, you have consumer hardware, for example, if you're making iPhones, uh, you PM for, you know, a hardware product that actually sells as a consumer product, then you have, you know, they, they kind of fall somewhere in the middle. Um, culturally speaking, enterprise software is a lot similar to hardware um, in terms of, you know, how how you think about the product enhancements, how do you think about your, you know, how do you work with stakeholders, how does the process look, um, et cetera. So that's that's kind of the the high level the takeaway uh, for this uh, for our conversation. And I'll be going into more depth uh, as we go through the the next few slides. So the first thing I want to cover is the product development process itself. Uh, I'm going to cover the the day in the life of a PM um, and in, in two aspects of it. So I'm going to cover customers. You know, what do your customers look like? Uh, how do you actually go about building that empathy? Uh, and what, what are the key metrics that you use to evaluate your product success, either in the hardware side and also I'm going to contrast that with what it is in the software side. The second aspect I'm going to cover is the actual engineering development part of the product development for two reasons. As a PM, you spend a lot more time working with engineers um, than you would with many other functions within the company. The second reason is there's also a lot that's common between hardware and software when it comes to, you know, you, in both cases, you actually work with engineers. And so it's, it's a lot easier to contrast it. So I'm going to quickly cover how do the engineers kind of structure their work? Uh, how do PMs partner with these, you know, with, with your, with your engineering teams and with engineers to ship products? Um, how are the products and the features released? Um, and lastly, how involved are you? When it comes to you know what 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 is your role as a PM in in the product development process with engineers as well as uh, later on once the product is shipped or ready to ship. Um, speaking of customer empathy, I I, I think it's important uh, for me to call out here that when I say hardware versus software, I'm going to be taking kind of an extreme lens here. I'm going to be comparing enterprise hardware. You know, for example, if you're working on servers, just an example, versus more of the consumer software space. Like I mentioned earlier, you may find that you know, there may be um, things that kind of fall along that spectrum. Um, but just to kind of give you a real clear difference, I'm going to take these extremes now. Um, you, may, you may still find that some of these things you know, apply if you kind of fall somewhere in the middle, if you're, for example, uh, a hardware PM for the iPhone, for example. Um, on the hardware side, you have dozens or hundreds of customers, not, not much more than that. It's, it's not to say that you only ship to these customers or you only have you know, hundreds of products that you release. You may have millions of products that you release. You may even have billions of, you, know, you may be shipping billions of chips, um, for example, if you're in the semiconductor space. But what's interesting is that in hardware space, you're, you kind of have a small group of customers um, that control and that define, you know, 80% of what your product should look like. They are, you know, they are outsized in their influence uh, for for what you what you ship. And this might be even for some of the more consumer focused products, where you may find out uh, that you know some of these customers that may buy millions of units from you have an outsized uh, control in 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 terms of what gets shipped and how it gets shipped and what gets prioritized. Whereas in the software side, you actually have, you know, you might have millions or even billions of customers and no single customer or not even a small group of customers, you know, actually get to control and tell you, uh, you know, have, have influence over, you know, what would you ship? Um, because of the fact that in the hardware space, you have uh, a small group of customers that you really need to be intentional about, you have high touch interactions. So you have emails. You, know, you have calls, you may even visit them uh, you may have, you know, at, at their locations. On the software side, it's usually lower touch interactions. You may be running a few tests, you may be doing a few studies and surveys with you know, the millions of customers that you have. You may do a sampling and interview a few of them, but it's in general a fairly low touch approach. Um, on the hardware side, your customers also are a lot more clear about what they want in terms of the features they want to see 
uh, for your products. On the software side, on the other hand, it's it's less uh, clear. They, they usually want a solution to the problem that they are facing and not as much, I want this button to look this way and to do this one function for me. That's what I mean by features versus solutions. Um, and so as a PM, you are also, and, and I'm going to skip the, you know, the technical understanding part and actually go into the metrics and the revenue, because as a PM, since your customers are more particular about what features you want in the hardware space, for example, you are, your metrics also focus a lot more on the functionality itself you're, and the feature set. You're looking at your metrics are you know, judging the performance of the product in terms of what is the speed, what is the uh, bill of materials, what is the, um, you know, the battery performance. You're also looking at yield and the cost uh, aspect of it. And so there's a lot more of a direct focus on revenue. If you are able to improve your bill of materials, you're able to reduce costs and in increase profitability. Uh, if you're able to make a product that ships, you know, a certain number of millions of units, then there, you know, as a PM, you spend a lot more time thinking about the revenue itself. You you're actually connected to the revenue. On the software side, um, it's usually abstracted a little, you know, one level away from a pure focus on revenue or cost. Uh, what I mean by that is a lot of your metrics focus on usage. Um, they either focus on adoption, on retention, on customer satisfaction, and even in terms of you know how how it ties to revenue. Usually, your 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 key metrics are focused on adoption, increasing lifetime value, increasing cost, uh, reducing customer acquisition costs, etc. Not really focused on revenue, even though these directly contribute to revenue. There's just that one kind of level of abstraction that happens um, in. The software space again i'm taking more extreme examples to kind of contrast it you may find that not all of this applies if you're for example working on enterprise software um there is also uh, another key call out here is that in the hardware space there is a high level of technical understanding that is expected from pms um i mean this even at the very early stages of you know when i was starting out as a pm in the hardware space there is a certain level of understanding that they expect you to have of the technical implementation of that product. What does it look like for, for example, if you're making uh, you know, chips? I, I was a PM for random access memories, which are memory products. You actually need to understand for, say, a smartwatch, what is the exact technical capability that you need for a RAM chip? On the other hand, the software side, it's a lot more creative there's a lot more focus on how do you solve the customer problems. And as a PM, you build a lot more of that intuition about what does it look like to solve the customer problem and not as much of what does it look like to ship a specific product or to have a particular feature set. Cool. Um, next, I'm going to cover the engineering development side of it. Um, this is this might be actually more cleanly defined around hardware versus software lines. Uh, what I mean by that is even if you you are for example in the enterprise software space, you might find out that there is you your your engineering development methodology is actually more in line with what software looks like, and very different from hardware uh, in terms of engineering development. Um, usually you have consolidated product releases in the hardware space, whereas in the software space, it's usually iterated product releases. What I mean by that is in the hardware space, I just, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you specific examples that might kind of help you understand what I mean by this. Um, I worked on memory products that took over a year. Sometimes they took, you know, year and many months to actually ship a product. And so you're actually dealing with a much longer time frame and you you only get to release every you know few quarters or maybe even a few years, um, and so because of that you have larger core teams because these are massive projects that you know spread out over many years. You may have um, to give you an example as as a PM I've probably had you know some products I've had teams of maybe thirty or forty engineers maybe even more. If you you know consider some of the uh, engineers that may kind of work in phases on the product. Um, on the other hand, 
Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, before I go into hardware space, let me go a little more down the hard. Uh, before I go into software space, I'm sorry. Let me go down the hardware um, points here. You have longer development cycles. As a PM, you also have to build a long-term plan. What I mean by that is you have to think about what the product is going to look like two years from now and prioritize accordingly. There is very little scope for you to reprioritize and you know kind of change course midway through because it's a much more it's it's a much bigger ship that you're you know, sailing. Um, there, and because of this, uh, like I mentioned earlier, because you don't get to do repeated product releases, there's a much higher level of quality and oversight that, that you would have as a PM in the hardware space. You would have more executive reviews, more presentations to your EVPs or your, even your CEOs. Um, and there's a much higher bar for, you know, you cannot have any bugs as you ship. It's got to be a perfect product. Um, to give you some examples, uh, you know, to give you a, a personal example, I've, I've shipped a product and you know had a bug that was discovered. And, and usually in those cases, you're you're dealing with having to do a recall because it's not you know something that you can just fix quickly over a weekend and have it go out there and impact you know and benefit customers. You might actually have to withdraw the products that have the sh the chips that have been shipped, and you know re uh, issue new uh, chips to your customers. So it's a much bigger cost when it comes to quality control. And so because of that, you have a lot more oversight. The last thing is um, you also have, you know, post-release, you're doing a lot more focused work on production monitoring, making sure that the chips are, you know, the yield is good. There's no sudden cost increases. Um, and you're also doing a lot, a lot of sales support. You're working with your field engineers to make sure customers are happy with the product and it's you know performing as it was intended when you started working on it. On the software side, it's kind of like you're building a ship while it sails. You have iterative product releases. Um, you have smaller teams usually. Uh, you don't really need a, pr a program manager to actually monitor these you know massive projects you're shipping. Because it's it's a lot more iterative. So you you know might have a team of six or ten engineers, and you work and you know work with them to actually ship enhancements to your to your product. You have shorter development cycles, which probably is just in weeks. It might be like a two week sprint, for example. Um, you also have a shorter term roadmap um, because you can constantly change and update your prioritization based on you know what you ship and how customers are adapting to that. That allows you to not have to plan a roadmap that's you know two years or three years down the line or maybe even a longer time period, because a lot of things can be changed and updated based on that, based on you know how your product is doing currently. There's less organizational oversight because, like I mentioned earlier, there is no you know you make a you have a bug in your product. It's fairly easy to fix it on the software side, and so they, they, you might still have release reviews and you might have status updates that you might have to share with with your leadership. But it's usually just to make sure that you are kind of going at a big picture level, you're going in the right direction. Um, Post-release as a PM, you spend a lot of time monitoring usage, scaling your product, um, making sure that rollout is going smooth and there's no you know, bugs that, you know, as, you, as you scale. So that's kind of the engineering development side of um, the product development process itself. After this, I'm going to go into the stakeholders. I'm just going to briefly cover the stakeholders um, because I, I, you know, I want to spend a lot of my time focusing on the um, the transition, how to make that switch. Um, yeah. So on the hardware side, you can see that you know engineering is fairly um, common. They might go by different, you know, they might have different organizations of engineers. So you might have design versus system engineers versus product engineers. You know, whereas on the software side might be more front end versus back end, you know, versus like platform engineers, for example. Um, product marketing is still fairly common. Your relationship with product marketing is very similar, very hardware and software space. Um, interesting thing is you might actually on the, in the hardware space you might be working a lot more with financial analysts because, like I said, you are actually looking at more revenue versus costs improvements. On the software side, since it's abstract a little bit. And since you're dealing with you know millions and even billions of users, the skill set is very different for analytics. And so you might actually be dealing with data scientists who might be you know combing through millions of data points, billions of data points to actually give you key insights. And you know you might partner with them differently. Um, from a customer-facing front, uh, I've seen that 
on the hardware side, you might have uh, sales and field engineers working with you closely as a PM. Whereas in the software front, you might have more kind of user researchers partnering with you. They are, you know, a lot more focused on what the customer experience is and they are partnering with you on that. Similarly, um, on the software space, you have experienced designers who think a lot about, you know, what the experience should look like for your customers. Uh, on hardware space, that role is often done by applications engineers who are thinking about, you know, what, what how do our chips look for the a, a smartwatch or for connected devices or for, you know, IoT sensors, for example, how do we design, you know, our chips to actually address those needs. So they are focusing a lot more on the on the customer experience um, side of things. Cool. Um, now we are in the later part of our conversation. I'm going to be covering uh, what are the skills that you need to succeed in uh, the hardware versus software space, and also how to make that transition. The first uh, key call out is there is a lot that's in common between hardware versus software PM. It it, it should not feel like you're kind of moving between different jobs um, uh, or different industries altogether. They are, you are irrespective of whether you're in hardware and software space, your job is to be your product's biggest proponent, right? You're supposed to, uh, you know, as in, in terms of skill set, uh, as a PM, you are spending a lot of time thinking about what your customers' needs are and how to translate them into products and into features. You are tying your product success to what your key business metrics are. And you partner with stakeholders to build a long-term vision for the product. All of that stays exactly the same, whether you're in hardware or the software space. Where it changes is in the hardware space, you are kind of playing the long game. Like I mentioned earlier, product development cycles take a lot longer. Um, and so you spend a lot more time, um, and, and this, this is where you know, your skills would differ. Uh, you, you spend time nurturing customer relationships. You have to have a good eye for understanding complex technical implementations and understand technical trends. Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, even at a very early um, level in your career, you might actually be thinking about, you know, what does the smart, again, taking an example, what does, you know, what, what is an autonomous car, uh, what are they going to need for autonomous driving? And, you know, what, how do you actually connect that to what, what chips you're making? Uh, or, you know, you might, if you're a product manager for, say, for example, servers, you might be thinking about what does the internet look like? two years from now, technically, uh, you know, from a technological perspective, and how does that translate into your product needs? Um, as, a, as a hardware product manager, you are, um, you should be spending a lot of time to prioritize perfection over speed. You really want to make sure that there are no bugs um, before the, the designs are handed off to production engineers and who actually, you know, go and build it out in silicon. Um, on the software side, you might, uh, you know, a quick summary of what your skill is, you should be able to scale with iterative wins. Um, there's a lot more of a short-term focus, uh, being able to make iterative improvements, focusing on tomorrow rather than, you know, uh, two years from now, for example. Um, in terms of the skill set, like I mentioned earlier, there is a lot of, um, there's, it's a much bigger customer base you're dealing with on the software side. And so being able to gather insights by combing through you know, billions of data points and getting those key insights is very important. Um, also being able to isolate and test the core solution. Uh, what I mean by that is you might get a lot of signals if you're dealing with large, you know, data uh, points. Being able to pull the, the key insights and the key solution and then being able to test that and get those learnings, you know, iteratively is, is uh, a, a key skill set you need in the software space. Um, the last one, like I mentioned uh, on the hardware side, it's, it's a lot about prioritizing speed over perfection. You want to be able to keep testing, keep releasing, and so your skills are going to differ accordingly uh, because you are expected to move faster as a uh, software product manager. Cool. The, the last thing I'm going to cover today, um, and I'm, I'm going to go a little more in depth with each of these, is how do you actually make the switch? I know a lot of you are um, considering making the switch and that's why you're on our call today. And so uh, I'm going to talk about how to make a switch. Um, a lot of the interest I've gotten is making a switch from hardware to software. 
uh, that's something that I myself, uh, that's a space that I'd made um, in, in, in my prior experience. And so I'd probably be focusing a little more on that, but a lot of these concepts apply irrespective of the direction you're going, even if you're going from software to hardware, uh, for example. So one of the, the most common ways uh, uh, I've seen folks make that switch is what I call transition products. What I mean by that is you work on products that are kind of in the middle in terms of the skills, in terms of the process for, for product development. Um, I've seen enterprise software and consumer hardware kind of fall in this transition product space. So like I mentioned, if you think of this as a spectrum from enterprise hardware to consumer software, you want to try uh, different products that kind of fall in the middle that help you make that switch um, easily. Um, some of the benefits of, of making this switch is that you have a much smoother um, learning curve because a lot, a lot of things will stay common. So for example, uh, just to give an example, if you're moving from say Intel to Apple, you'll find a lot of things that are, you know, are common in terms of the process. And when I say Apple, I mean the hardware side of Apple. You find a lot of things that are common. Um, there is very little financial cost to this. In fact, if you play your cards right, you'll probably go with a hike uh, and you'll be able to make that transition. It's also the least disruptive to your lifestyle. You're not having to, you know, um, learn new, like learn completely new skills and, you know, have to change how your lifestyle works um, as you make this transition. Um, some of the challenges with this, one, um, you, of course, have to apply for jobs. So there's the job search overhead, you know, preparing your resume, interviewing, um, and going through the, the mental you know, ups and downs of the interview process, or the job search process. There are also maybe limited opportunities. You may not find too many companies that are kind of in the middle. You may not find too many roles that are in the enterprise software space, uh, for example, versus you, know, you might find a thousand, over a thousand PM roles if you open up Google's career portal today. You know, just, just in terms of the, the, the size of the opportunity, you might find fewer opportunities in enterprise software, for example. You also may run the risk of um, kind of getting pigeonholed um, in, into a specific segment. Um, again, just to give an example, you might be working on enterprise software for, you know, payroll for large and large businesses that have over 2,000 customers or 5,000 customers. That might be a very, very specific niche that you might uh, run the risk of getting pigeonholed into if you, if you get into that and spend too many years uh, in that space. So that's, uh, again, pros and cons. If, if that is something that you're really excited about, there is no harm in that. It's just, you know, the trade-offs that you need to keep in mind as you think about these options. Um, the second thing I've seen is uh, stakeholder roles. What I mean by that is you transition to roles from product management that are more kind of product agnostic. So marketing, program management, business development, customer, uh, corporate finance, corporate strategy, these are roles that you know you could you could easily transition from hardware to software space. When I say easily, I mean more easily than a, a PM making the transition, um, you know, between these different industries. They're more product agnostic. Um, usually, I've seen a lot of people are able to make these transitions internally uh, within their company. It's much harder if you're you know product manager and you want to get into business development in a completely different company. You might find that harder. But if you're willing to do that within your company. You might have a much easier time recruiting. It might just be, you know, having a conversation with your, for example, with your marketing manager, and you know, see if there are interesting opportunities that you might be kind of able to flex into. Um, easier onboarding. You have a ton of social capital in the company since it's a company that you're already working at, um, and you also would be able to build uh, cross-functional skills and experience. What I mean by that is, you know, a lot of um, a lot of your work as a product manager benefits from having prior experience in marketing or having prior experience in corporate strategy. It just kind of helps you build those um, skills that you can then take over uh, and transition over to product management whenever you make that switch. Um, the last benefit of this is also reversible. You can decide, you know, two weeks into your new marketing role that, you know what, you actually did enjoy product management and you actually want to go back to it. It's fairly you reverse that. Uh, versus, you know, some of the other options out there to make that switch. Um, one of the big challenges with this is it requires a certain amount of, you know, certain tenure, and it requires you to have a certain level of social capital within your company. 
you cannot, you know, if, if you joined your current company two weeks ago, you cannot be able to make that switch as easily. Um, it also requires you to have relationships, relationships within your company and, you know, be able to make that switch. Uh, I also want to call out that one of the big challenges with this is that there might be potential like uh, uh, lifestyle disruptions. For example, if you get into this development, you might have to, you know, travel more often or you might have to work different hours. Um, if you're in marketing, for example, you might have to work with folks in different countries. And so you might have, you know, there, there might be some lifestyle disruptions that you might uh, face. The, the last challenge that, that also is something important to keep in mind is you might have income and growth limitations. Um, what I mean by that is you might find out that, you know, you, you might be at the highest income bands for, for you know, if you're moving from, from say product management to uh, product marketing or program management. Um, in general, I've noticed that product managers are on the slightly on the higher side, um, you know, for the same level, you might find PMs are at the higher level compensation compared to some of these other roles that I've talked about. And so you might be at the top of the band and you might also be limited in terms of your growth opportunities because you might not, you know, for example, if you move from a senior uh, product manager to senior marketing manager, you might not be able to make it to the next level, which, you know, for example, might be staff marketing manager, just because a skill set at that level would require a certain level of experience in the marketing domain itself. And so you might face some growth limitations uh, in this. But if you're looking at this more of a short term switch, you know, for like a year or two years, and then you're able to make the transition um, out into product management again, then this makes sense as, as a kind of a middle ground uh, for you to be able to switch industries more easily and then switch into product management. The, the last option and which, which is I've seen a lot of people uh, take, I myself have, uh, you know, followed this path is to kind of do a full career pivot or a career reset. Um, what I mean by that is you either go back to school, get, you know, get a master's program, get an MBA or a master's in program uh, product management or engineering. Um, another option is you could join a consulting firm, but often I've seen consulting firms are only, they also often require MBAs uh, to be able to make the switch. So if, for example, you, you know, already have an MBA, um, then you might be, and you're looking to make the switch from hardware to software or software to hardware, consulting firms might offer you some of these interesting roles that help you make that transition. Uh, you might be, you know, doing copy strategy specifically for certain industries, and so you can build those skill sets to make a transition. Um, the benefit of doing this, you know, kind of career reset is that you have a very high likelihood of success. Um, you go to a good master's program in, you know, engineering product, uh, product management or uh, bis business administration, you're almost guaranteed to be able to make the switch very easily. You know, you have a ton of opportunities out there, um, you know, a ton of companies that recruit from these, uh, you know, top programs. Um, and they, you know, give you that opportunity to make that switch very easily. There's also a lot more of a career flexibility. You could, you know, go into your business school program and find out, you know what, I want to be doing private equity. You can do that. It's a total career reset that you get. It's kind of gives you a clean slate. Um, in a lot of cases I've seen, there's also a sharp income boost, um, especially for MBAs, but also for uh, a lot of the master's programs. Um, just because, you know, they, they respect, uh, again, if, this is assuming that you go to a, a good, a, a top ranked school, uh, and you're able to make that switch, they usually bring you in at a much higher level than you were, uh, you know, initially. So you would see a, a sharp income boost. Um, a key call out here is that to really take advantage of this, you want to be going to a top, uh, business school or a top engineering school. Um, because that, that makes a big difference. You don't want to be going to a lower rank school um, and then face a lot of limited opportunities. And then you also have a lot of these challenges. You, have, you know, you will have, irrespective of, you know, which, which kind of school you go into, you might still end up having significant lifestyle disruptions. If you have kids, it might involve relocation. If you're going full-time to, you know, school, uh, might involve significant financial implications. Um, you might even, you know, have no income for a year or two years if you're doing it full time. If you're doing it part time as well, you would have, you know, significant lifestyle disruption where, you know, you might have to put another 20 hours or 30 hours a week on your you know, education uh, for this. 
there's it's also still going to have you know a job search overhead that's going to come here because you're going to have you know have to go through the process of finding a new job um, even though it might be easier um, at school just because they might have career boards and job boards and all those things um, but yeah that's these are the, the three common ways i've seen folks be able to make that switch uh, from hardware to software or even from software to hardware if, if, if that's something you're looking to do. I'm happy to talk about this, uh, you know, offline and um, if, 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 you know, you're interested in these uh, options and um, yeah, that's, that's about making the switch. Uh, I'm going to quickly summarize, uh, like I said earlier, hardware has a lot, you know, it's kind of a spectrum hardware versus software. It's not as, you know, black or white, you might find uh, enterprise software often falls kind of in the middle of the spectrum. In fact, there's a lot more in common with hardware um, than it is with software. And so if you are looking at just doing hardware to software, enterprise software might be a, a much easier transition for a lot of people um, based on you know, the skill sets that you have. Um, the last thing is, you know, happy to connect. I have my LinkedIn profile here. I have just joined Substack, like maybe couple of weeks ago. So I've not actually been writing on this, but I intend to be writing on Substack as well about this, about, you know, the hardware with software, about product management, about tech trends, um, things that I gen, uh, genuinely enjoy um, kind of reading and writing about. Um, so yeah, ha happy to connect with uh, all of you offline um, and um, all the best with, with as you make this transition. Um, and thank you for thank you for joining this conversation today. Thank you for uh, being here. I'm happy to connect. All right. Thank you.